Hello, my fellow Ripplers. This is Chris Miles, your cash flow expert and anti financial advisor. Hey, hey guys, welcome to the show that's for you and it's about you. Those who work so hard for your money and you're ready for your money to start working harder for you now, right? You want that freedom, you want that cash flow, you want that prosperity today, not 30 or 40 years from now, if you're lucky, right? But right now, so you can have that life that you love doing what you love with those that you love. But guys, so much more importantly than that, it's because you guys not just want to create financial freedom for yourself, but you want to create a legacy. You want to create a life of meaning and purpose that blesses the lives of others. Because as you become free, you can help others become free and become blessed as well. So guys, thank you for being a part of this show. Thank you for allowing me to create a ripple effect through you. Check us out on iTunes, of course. If you aren't doing that already, give us a review, rate us. That'd be great. And also check out our YouTube channel or the, the Money Ripples with Chris Miles page. You can check that out to see more information. All right, guys. So today I've got a special guest. It was actually came from one of my clients who said, Chris, you've got to get to know this guy because you know if it comes down to like crypto or Bitcoin or anything, like this is the guy you should be talking to. Like this guy should be on your show. And for those of you guys that have been following me a long time, you guys remember a couple of years back, this right around the end of 2018, I was like, guys, it's going to crash. And then it did, which was a kind of a great opportunity for me to buy in after it crashed, which was great. And, uh, and some of you guys were like, wait, 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 you, you did what? You just told us it was crap. And now you bought into it and you know, all that kind of stuff, right? Well, this is why I'm bringing on Jeff here. Now, Jeff, just so you know a little bit about him. So he's the CEO of Neighbors Group. Uh, he did his own management portfolio that he has of, like his own kind of managed fund, if you would say it that way. Um, he's also the host of the Self-Directed Life podcast. Another thing about him too is that, I mean, this guy, I mean, he's been around the block, right? I mean, he's gotten everything from real estate. Uh, he was in the mortgage business about the same time I was back in the early 2000s. Uh, went into real estate, sold off at the perfect time. He'll probably tell you more about that a little bit. Uh, but he's used a lot of different investments to help him build his own wealth as well. And he's also now started to do this for his clients where he creates his own fund that includes things like digital currencies or real estate or other types of investments, whether it's equity or, or bond based or whatever it might be. And so guys, I want to welcome here, Jeff Neighbors. So Jeff, welcome to our show. Hey, thanks for having me. You bet, man. So to give us a little bit more on that backstory there. Like your whole little, you've had almost like perfect timing with a lot of things that you've experienced over the last almost really 20 years now. Yeah. So I got started in the uh, mortgage banking business and I took the money I made there and invested it into real estate. And my plan was really just to collect a lot of doors and live mm -hmm. happily ever after. Yeah. Um, I was pretty well on my way to doing that until around 2006. I saw this book that said how to profit from the coming bust in real estate. Mm -hmm. And I read the book wanting to write a strongly worded email to correct the author. Excuse me, your book is wrong. And um, <laughs> I read the book and realized he was right and I was wrong and that my all my blood, sweat and tears was invested in this thing that was about to get pushed off a cliff yeah. uh, pretty much by Wall Street and, uh, and the central banks and the economic policies. And that kind of sent me down that rabbit hole. I did what was crazy at the time. I sold all of my properties in 2007 and my mortgage uh -huh. company in 2006. I was a laughing stock of everybody who knew me until the crash that I was telling everybody about actually came. And since then, I, I realized that there can be something that really big that mm -hmm. everyone can get wrong. And then when it happens it, later, everyone will just forget that they were all wrong. And, and that has allowed me to be on the leading edge of things. And there's just a lot of things hidden in plain view. So I, I've come to actually pay a lot of attention to economics, which sounds really boring, but affects all of us. And I've found that it can be really exciting mm -hmm. when you can make sure that you're protecting your wealth and growing your wealth, even when it kind of goes up against the conventional wisdom. Yeah. Awesome, man. So obviously the, the point of this show uh, we want to talk about is, is really crypto, right? Like yeah. we want to talk about like what that is, because we've been seeing it hit all time highs, uh, just like everything's been hitting all time highs. We're seeing real estate hit all time highs. We've seen the stock market hit all time highs, right? Um, and there's all this talk about bubbles and, you know, and this and that, right? Uh, so I'm going to come at this from, you know, this perspective of a lot of the listeners here is first and foremost, why do you like investing in, in crypto? I know you don't put your whole portfolio in that, but why do you put a good percentage of it there? So in my case, my uh, portfolio is pretty heavily into Bitcoin, but I didn't put it in that way. Um, I started investing in uh, cryptocurrency in uh, seven years ago. So mm -hmm. the growth over the past seven years made it a much bigger part of my portfolio than I would have 
constructed it to be. Mm -hmm. But um, I think one of the best things an investor can do in the right circumstances is to let the winners ride. So it, rebalancing would have actually caused me to lose a lot of the profits that, that I've been able to have. I like, I like crypto because it is, uh, it's a lot like real estate, frankly. And, and I think mm -hmm. real estate investors are one group that haven't yet really embraced Bitcoin. But I think mm -hmm. that the mechanics of how to think about it really jibe quite well. I like to think of, for example, the largest cryptocurrency, Bitcoin. It's almost like a piece of land in like a newly, like a newly discovered land, sort of like mm -hmm. America was once a newly discovered land for Europeans. And yeah. there's, it's like, there's a, a, you can do your research and find out why a lot of people are going to that land and why more people are going to go to that land. Mm -hmm. And of course you want to own the land before everybody comes to build on it. And then you can actually turn that land into a income producing asset. Mm -hmm. That's how I think about Bitcoin. Uh, and it has been the best performing asset class really in known history. I think that it's going to continue to be the best performing asset class uh, moving forward, largely because of the supply and demand economics. Mm -hmm. One of the interesting things that ties together what you were saying about, you know, earlier, okay, all these asset classes are at all time highs mm -hmm. and it's not because of the assets. It's because of the money, yeah. the dollars being devalued and real estate is a store of value. Yeah. And Bitcoin is just this new kind of store of value that is liquid and has payment rails to transfer it anywhere around the world even if it's a hundred million dollar transfer mm -hmm. faster and cheaper than you could do through the banking system. So there's a lot right. of really new and interesting things going on and we're still so early in Bitcoin. In fact, today, mass mutual, one of the largest insurance carriers in the world, mm -hmm. uh, they have over 500 billion or 675 billion of dollars under management. Yeah. And they're the first major insurance carrier to announce that they have just acquired some Bitcoin. So it's kind of like a land grab. Yeah. The institutional players have gotten involved uh, this year and I, we're still so early mm -hmm. uh, that I think it's important for people to learn about it, especially real estate investors. And that's a big thing. Institutional money starting to go in, which is driving prices up, right? Yeah. What's really interesting is one of the biggest limiting beliefs that have caused more and more people to lose out on the opportunity with Bitcoin over mm -hmm. any multi-year period yeah. is related to, it just went up so much. How mm -hmm. much more could it go up? Right. And when you're talking about an asset that from, from its start to its all-time high, Mm -hmm. grew 20 million percent, right. you have to realize that something is going on here that mm -hmm. is not like anything that you've seen before. The closest thing that you could say that this is like is maybe Amazon or Google or Facebook. And that's because those are all networks. Mm -hmm. And there's a, a concept called network effects and network effects cause exponential growth, which is basically growth that ends up being far larger than we ever would have believed. Mm -hmm. And then it happens. Right. Um, unlike Facebook and Google and Amazon, I still think that a lot of Bitcoin's growth may lay ahead. Well, I know there's projections from some pretty credible sources say that Bitcoin should hit a million dollars by 2025, which would seem ridiculous, right? But uh, I mean, it seemed ridiculous that five years ago it was down around a thousand bucks or whatever, you know? Yeah, by no means is it a, a sure bet. There's a lot of risk mm -hmm. management principles and some are unique to crypto as well. But the creation of Bitcoin actually was discussed openly on a public forum on the mm -hmm. internet. This mystery man or woman or group who created it that go by the pseudonym Satoshi Nakamoto explained that, you know, if this thing succeeds, it's designed to become worth a million dollars per Bitcoin. And there's enough Bitcoin for everyone to have a piece because each one actually represents 100 million Satoshis or sats. So mm -hmm. it's designed for every Bitcoin to become like a million dollar asset. And we still have a ways to go before there, but you're starting to see these institutions come on board and give these uh, seemingly insane price targets that, you know, you, you got to wonder what do they know that, that we don't know if we're just sitting on the sidelines being skeptical. Yeah. It kind of makes you wonder, like, it's one of two things. Either one, they know something we don't know, or two, maybe they're just going crazy. Maybe it's like back in 
I remember, you know, the early 2000s when they were buying a bunch of WorldCom and they're buying you know, all that kind of stuff that eventually crashed, right? Or even Lehman Brothers, you know, you could say that too. Now, I, I would say this. Now, no doubt the technology is the part that I think almost everybody can agree upon is the valuable part here, right? Like the fact that the banking systems, how they use, I mean, I, I told my wife the other day, it's, it's frustrating that you have to wait forever to clear a check, but it takes seconds for a card to approve to say, hey, I've got funds. But we have to wait days sometimes for big checks to clear through banks. But this solves that problem, right? And that's a big reason I know with Bitcoin is like one of the advantages among many, right? Uh, what do you say to that? Like why Bitcoin versus just the technology? Yeah, sure. So it really has to do with monetary policy, which mm -hmm. sounds very complicated, but it's <laughs> somewhat simple. If we have a piece of land and we start subdividing it, you know, every time we slice it up, we're getting a smaller and smaller piece. So we end up kind of with a fair system of measurement. But with the money system, they are printing money constantly. Mm -hmm. So, you know, one good metaphor would be like, what if you played a football game, but in between every down, some, you know, mysterious group of people who we can't even talk to would change the length of a yard, right? And yeah. then, so you could be running towards that end zone and you could be getting closer and closer, but these other mm -hmm. people could be adjusting it to get further and further away. Yeah. That is essentially money printing and its effect inflation. Yeah. And, you know, one of the concerning things that we see about all assets going up in price, this is historically what we see in a currency collapse. So one possibility about how the time we're living through right now may go down in history books mm -hmm. is we may be going through a global currency collapse of the dollar itself, which is right. the base of the global financial system, kind of in slow motion. So there's there's another place that you see soaring stock markets, and that's like Zimbabwe, Argentina, mm -hmm. Turkey, Venezuela. And so what we're really seeing is actually a collapsing currency. In right. our case, because our currency is still useful, and from one day to the next, it's it's the same value. We don't notice the sort of slow motion collapse, which, you know, from 1971, when we came off the gold standard to today, mm -hmm. you know, we're down over, you know, 90% of the dollar's purchasing power. Right. Now we're in the exponential part of that curve where the institutions have been doing their homework the last few years. Mm -hmm. And it's, in my view, it's pretty clearly that they do know something the average person doesn't know, which is, you know, this is like a game of musical chairs. Uh -huh. Like every game of musical chairs, the music will stop. And when mm -hmm. the music stops, what you want is the hardest asset, the yeah. asset that is the most scarce. Right. And real estate has a certain scarcity to it. Mm -hmm. Gold has a certain scarcity to it. Right. The main technology that's sucking in all this value into Bitcoin right now mm -hmm. isn't really the payment rails of transmitting currency around the world. Mm -hmm. It's more of that store of value where this is more being treated like real estate or gold. And gold is a $9 trillion market and real estate is a over $200 trillion market. Right. So Bitcoin today is a $340 billion market. It's not even a $1 trillion market. Right. So for Bitcoin to reach the market cap of gold, which I think there's a real good chance it could surpass it, that takes it to $450,000 Bitcoin. And oddly enough, the higher the market cap of Bitcoin goes, mm -hmm. the more risk palatable it is to institutions who have such large checkbooks, they can't put very much into such a tiny market. But the bigger the market goes, the more they can put into it without causing slippage and running the price up too quickly. And yeah. so oddly enough, the higher that Bitcoin goes, the more money institutions will put into it. And yet we're sitting here at this point where the only barrier to entry for the individual investor is a little bit education. It's true. Yeah, it's very true. You know, so yeah, I see it kind of the same way. It's like a commodity, right? And the, even the fact you can, the mining of Bitcoin is controlled. More like if somebody keeps finding more gold, there's more supply. Because the truth is gold prices haven't gone up at all. And like to your point earlier was, it's all been because we've been printing more money, right? That That's the only variable is how much money we're pumping out there. And that just devalues our currency and then increases the, the real assets that are being tied to it. Yeah. And full disclosure, I like gold. You know, the, the largest gold reserves in the world was discovered this year in Siberia. So if they start pulling uh -huh. that out of the ground cost effectively, then it's right. almost like gold printing, just like money printing. Uh -huh. um, that kind of thing is impossible with Bitcoin. So usually, so one of the really novel things that people don't understand about Bitcoin at first glance is that it's the first asset 
that has a hard cap on the total supply yet is infinitely divisible. So in other words, there's never going to be a dilution or an inflation, yet there's, you're always going to be able to create more Bitcoin by uh-huh. dividing it more infinitely, which you cannot do with gold. Uh-huh. The difference between creating more by dividing it is like a, a stock split. I was going to say, that's like a split or even a reverse right. split. So when you divide it, everybody who has some mm-hmm. still has the same percentage of the total supply. Right. So nobody has any kind of covert transfer of wealth. Yeah. When you have, you know, inflation or dilution, what's happening is whatever amount you have, your percentage piece of the pie is being transferred away mm-hmm. without the number of units even changing. So, this is why you could buy a house for $10,000, you know, in 1950, and now that house costs 700,000. Majority of that value increase isn't actually real, it's nominal. I still like real estate for cash flow, and there's a lot of great things you can do with real estate. Yeah, but it's not like it's just going through the roof in terms of value. It's really the the purchasing power of the dollar. That's only possible because they're creating more dollars by increasing the supply, not by dividing the existing supply. Right. So this is a new realm of economics where, for the first time ever, we have a completely capped supply asset that is openly tradable. 365, 24-7, everyone can have it. The system runs itself. No government Mm -hmm. can stop it. And it's infinitely divisible. So these are the building blocks of what could be the next global reserve currency. And if you see that kind of future for Bitcoin, then the numbers start to turn into multiple millions of dollars per Bitcoin um, over, you know, maybe a 10, 15 year time period. Yeah. So I'm going to play devil's advocate, of course. Right. So, uh, you know, you just mentioned like about the different governments, right? Now, there are a lot of governments that they're already talking about creating their own digital currency. Now, you mentioned, of course, the governments can't touch Bitcoin, right? So what would happen if they said, we're creating our own digital currency, use us, don't use Bitcoin. And, and I know they could try to force it. They would try to, you know, create regulations in the only country, right? Um, what would that do to Bitcoin? We actually have a historical precedent of that exact thing being done in many of the previous currency collapses uh, that have happened before. A really notable one, you know, a lot of times when you look at a currency collapse in like a third world country, a banana republic, you kind of wonder how much could that carry over to a world superpower? Well, in the 1920s, Germany was the world superpower and they had a currency uh, collapse. During Mm -hmm. that time, so the German uh, currency was called the mark, Mm -hmm. um, and they had a papier mark, which means the paper mark that they could print and do monetary policy operations with. And then they had a geld mark, which is the gold mark, which was backed by gold. So at that time, you had two coexisting currencies. You had one that was hard to Mm -hmm. create more of because it's backed by gold and one that was easy money. So hard money and easy money. So what happens is when you hold the easy money, you lose your purchasing power and your family starts to go, you know, starve. Mm -hmm. And when you hold the hard money, you start gaining purchasing power as other people start flocking into it for their own preservation of capital. Yeah. And in coexistence, regardless of what anybody says with any force of law or authority, everybody's DNA takes over and they want to survive. So what that turned out to be in a Germany hyperinflation was it became illegal to refuse to accept paper marks. And yet everyone broke the law because nobody wants to kill their family in the name of legal compliance. Right. So ultimately there are limits to what laws can do Mm-hmm. We're learning about that as obviously the drug war was a giant failure and mm-hmm. telling people they can't have drugs makes them do more drugs. Portugal yeah. legalized all drugs and now drug use went down and uh, crime went down. Yeah. So there's this counterintuitive truth that it's not all about a bully in the yard that just uh-huh. tells everybody what to do and everybody complies. There's just this sense of individual freedom that you can't separate from, from human life And what that means is that monetary policy has its limits. Mm -hmm. Uh, So coming back to central bank digital currencies, look, if you are watching, let's say you have two accounts. One is easy crypto money. It's not real crypto, but a a crypto imitator of the central bank digital currencies. And then you have hard money or scarce, say Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. Over time, if you watch the value of your Bitcoin going up and the value of your digital currencies going down, what are you going to do? 
you're going to go for Bitcoin. What are you going to do when you have new money coming in and you have to decide which account to put it in? Yeah, you're going to go with the one that goes up? Yeah, so it's like standing on the coast of Florida and arguing with a hurricane. The hurricane is not going to listen, right? Because the hurricane is uh -huh. part of nature. Well, economics are part of nature too. It's, it's the nature of how people behave when value and incentives are involved. And in the realm yeah. of uh, economics, central bank digital currencies don't actually detract from Bitcoin. They actually just create more on-ramps to Bitcoin. So sure. the sooner that central bank digital currencies come onto the scene, I think the faster uh, people will be finding themselves moving more capital into Bitcoin. <laughs> So rather than creating competition and pulling money away, it's actually going to be encouraging people to buy Bitcoin. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you see this all, all the time. It's just, uh, you know, unintended consequences. Yeah. Interesting, huh? Now, what would you say? I mean, Bitcoin still is in its relative infancy, right? So that's why with speculation and institutional money, which is part of the scariness of this, right, where the risk is, is that institutions could pull their money out at any time and it can drop, the, drop it like a rock, right? And so the more institutional money that goes in, the more they can actually create some volatility and such. What does someone do if they want to protect themselves against that? Or, or is that part of the risk? You just have to make sure you manage it by trying not to put a whole lot of your money into this kind of, this kind of, uh, in, you know, this kind of asset, right? That's a great question. And there's not a one size fits all answer on what, you know, what everybody should do, but you've got, mm -hmm. you've got different ways. I mean, you could, uh, if you're a high net worth person, you could, you know, take a look at, allocating to a hedge fund that uses like a trading algorithm mm. to try to balance out some of that volatility. That's not my favorite approach. I think that, you know, when you look at constructing a portfolio and you add Bitcoin to it, if you look at Bitcoin by itself, then mm -hmm. it looks like this wild and crazy ride. Yeah. But if you look at a portfolio and then you add Bitcoin to it and you measure before and after the volatility of the portfolio, mm -hmm. because Bitcoin is an uncorrelated asset, it actually reduces the volatility of the portfolio. So hmm. this is what institutional investors woke up to over the past 12 months yeah. is they realized that this hyper volatile asset when viewed through a holistic view into the portfolio that it goes into mm -hmm. reduces volatility and increases risk-adjusted return in just about all multi-year time periods. So it's just kind of like a pair of glasses that you put on and you just realize, oh my gosh, through the proper lens, uh, this is a risk-reducing asset with the effect on the whole portfolio. Yeah. Do you think this is something that could collapse? Like it just go, like just go by the wayside and then it gets replaced by something else that's another fad or whatever you might want to call it, right? Yeah. So f first off, when I put money into Bitcoin originally, mm -hmm. I, my logic was that there seemed to be some manipulation in the gold markets. And I went, oh, well, what was that thing that's supposed to be like a digital gold where you're not supposed to be able to manipulate the supply because of some right. new computer system? I took a portion of gold and put it into Bitcoin and just assumed I waved goodbye and said, mm -hmm. all right, nice knowing you, money. Um, <laughs> and I just figured, look, there's a 90% chance this is going to fail and go to zero. Yeah. Uh, but in the 5% chance that it's do it doesn't, it means something spectacular has occurred. We have something very special here, and it may become worth a lot more. That's Today, probably that risk seven return years, you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, yeah. so there, there, you're like, oh, 90% chance of failure, never take that bet. Well, mm -hmm. what's the payoff? If the right. payoff is 1,000x, you take that bet every time, as long mm -hmm. as you can stomach the risk of loss, right? right? Odds wise, if you're, mm -hmm. if you're in Vegas and they give you that bet, take the bet. If we all take yeah. the bet, the casinos will go out of business. Right. So, you know, it's, it's really good odds. Now the odds have shifted to mm -hmm. the point where it's been largely de-risked. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the risk is much lower, but while there may not be 20 million percent return ahead, Mm -hmm. There may still be a thousand percent return ahead or five thousand percent return ahead. These are all within the realm of possibility. And now you could almost say the risk adjusted return is even higher than it was seven years ago because mm -hmm. the risk is lower. So, what's the real risk? Main risk is that a vulnerability is discovered within the actual technology itself, it gets exploited before it can get patched. And Somebody just breaks the network and, and, just, and destroys it. In the yeah. realm of cryptography, remember, cryptography is what's been keeping our nukes secure for the last 50 years. Mm -hmm. So the same thing, that's, if it's good enough for the nukes, you know, it's, it's mm -hmm. good enough for a new monetary system. And there's a, a feature in cryptography called the Lindy effect that just basically says every day that a new cryptographic network is not hacked and broken, 
mm-hmm. the likelihood of it being ha- of it happening in, in the next day gets lower and lower and lower. So we're now, yeah. you know, measurably probably below a 1% chance of the network failing. But you could have, co- you, you mentioned collusion uh, with institutions. That's probably one of the, the biggest risks as well. Mm-hmm. If there are a couple of plays that could be made there, but the counter argument to that is family offices. Family offices are essentially very private and secretive, wealthy people, billionaires and centimillionaires. Yeah. This is where a team of people manages just the wealth of one person or family. Yeah. Family offices have been in Bitcoin for several years. Mm-hmm. They're way ahead of institutions. They get the case for it. They buy the dips when, when the price comes down. And right. they have a lot of money too. I think there's a quite a good chance that if the major institutions try to collude to collapse the market, that mm-hmm. family offices will show up with with a buy wall on the order books that you know just doesn't let it go down so far that the security of the network could be compromised. Interesting stuff. Well, Jeff, I appreciate your time. This has been a wealth of information for sure. Uh, if you want to follow you or, or reach out to you, what's the best way they can do that? Probably uh, really just filling out the form at neighbors.com, N-A-B-E-R-S.com. Mm-hmm. Um, that can kind of be a gateway to the various things that we do. And we publish a lot of reports. We do webinars regularly. Um, and that's probably the best way to just kind of start that conversation. Awesome. And of course, everybody, we're not giving investment advice here. We're not telling you go out and buy up all the Bitcoin in the world or anything like that. We're not even telling you to sell your Bitcoin. This has nothing to do with it. This is just purely educational. But uh, Jeff, uh, definitely. I, I got a lot of good education from this. I really appreciate your time today. Hey, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. You bet. And everybody else, hey, I hope you make it a one fun prosperous day. And we'll see you later. Visit us online at moneyripples.com. 